this is our last section in AP stats. Um, it's uh, not my favorite because I feel like it's kind of just tacked on and overly complicated. So I'm going to try and simplify it as much as possible. Um, but it's going to be pretty calculator heavy as I simplify this. So just make sure you have that at the ready. And here's the idea. We've done all different uh, types of inference. So we did confidence intervals for a proportion, which was finding a plausible interval of values for a population proportion. Then we did hypothesis tests for a proportion. And we did confidence intervals for a difference in proportions and hypothesis tests for a difference in proportions. Then we did the same thing for means. And then finally, we finished up with chi-square tests, right? Um, and now we're going to talk about inference for slope. So it's been a while, but when we look at scatter plots to, to decide if there's an association between two variables, generally we're looking at only a sample of data. So for example, this is a scatter plot for the duration uh, and interval between eruptions of Old Faithful for all 263 eruptions in a single month. And this is then the population least squares regression line. So this is actually a population scatter plot. And the population being all 263 eruptions in one month. But if we look at just a sample of um, eruptions in a month, so in this case, it looks like here's a sample of 15 eruptions. Now, in the sample, they have the blue line is the population regression line. So that's the one that comes from here, the actual true population of eruptions. But if we just took a sample of 15 and we computed a regression line over that, you would get a slightly different regression line. And if we took a different sample of 15, we would get a slightly different regression than that. Different sample, different regression. So the idea is for a population scatter plot, there is a true slope and y intercept, right? But if you're just taking a sample of data, you're just getting an estimate of that true slope and that true y intercept. Okay, so then just like we did with a proportion or a mean, if you have an estimate of a parameter, then you can make inference about the true parameter by either making a confidence interval for it or doing a hypothesis test about a claim about it. And that's what we're going to do today. All right, so let me kind of simplify this as much as I can. The sample regression line is what we did in chapter three. That's the y hat equals a plus bx, where y hat is the estimated mean y value for a given value of x, a is the sample y intercept, and b is the sample slope. And then just like with other statistics, we generally use Greek letters to represent the true population values. So the population regression y line is mu y equals alpha plus beta x, where mu y is the true mean y value. Alpha is the population y intercept and beta is the population slope. All right. So the idea is that if you just take a sample of data, of bivar bivariate data, you're going to get different slopes of your regression line for different samples. And most of the inference that we're going to do today is inference specifically for the slope of the regression line.
Okay. This is a bunch of stuff that I'm going to skip over because you're not going to be hand calculating this. But here are the conditions for regression inference. Okay, so these are the conditions that you may have to check. It's pretty unlikely that you will have to. Um, the, the, the question, there will be questions about um, inference for regression, but there'll be really few and far between, which is why, again, I feel like this is kind of a tacked on section and I'm, I'm not in love with it, but we do want to cover it. The acronym to remember the uh, conditions is LINER. All right, and so the first one, the L represents linear. And so what you want is some evidence that the relationship between X and Y is linear. And so that just means that the scatter plot needs to be roughly linear. The I is independent. This is our 10% condition. So you take your sample size, you multiply it by 10, and you say, assume that the population is larger than this. Normal, for any particular value of X, the, the response Y varies according to a normal distribution. I'll, I'll talk about how to check this. This is a weird one. Equal standard deviations, the standard deviation of Y, is the same for all values of x. Again, I'll go over how to check that. And then random, of course, the data has to come from a random sample or a randomized experiment. Okay, let's talk about how to check each condition. Linear, and most of the time, the, the questions, as you'll see, the examples will do, you won't have to hand check these conditions. They'll give you all this information. They'll give you like computer output, graphs of the data, the residual plot, and you'll just have to make the statements that the conditions are satisfied. So for linear, they'll usually give you like a scatter plot or a residual plot. And so here's good, the condition is satisfied. This scatter plot, roughly linear, right? Here's bad, remember, a residual plot should look like random scatter. If there's any evidence of curvature like this has, that's bad. That means that the linear regression doesn't actually do a good job of fitting the data, okay? So an example of good here, an example of bad would be a re residual plot with curvature. What you might see on like the AP exam would be, are the conditions satisfied? And if they give you a residual plot with a curved pattern, you would go, no. The, the data doesn't uh, fit the linear regression because there's a curve in the residual plot. All right. Independent, again, that's just the 10% condition. So just multiply your sample size by 10 and then make a statement that we can assume the population is bigger than that. Normal, this is a new one. Make a histogram, dot plot, stem plot, box plot, or normal probability plot. You're not going to do that because you don't know what that is because it's not necessary for this course. But probably what you, I would have you make is a box plot of the residuals and then make a statement that there are, there's not strong skew or outliers. Again, most of the time what they'll do is just give you that information as I'll show you in an example. All right, equal standard deviations. This just means that the residual plot should be roughly uniform scatter like this on the left. Non-equal standard deviations would be like, as your X values increase, the scatter increases, like this residual plot. You can see that it's amplifying. And that just means that your predictions are getting worse as the X values increase. So that's bad. Uniform scatter is good. And then random, this is something we've always needed. It has to come from a random sample or a randomized experiment. All right, so here's an example. Mrs. Barrett's class did a fun experiment using paper helicopters. After making 70 helicopters using the same template, students randomly assigned 14 helicopters to each of five drop heights. 152 centimeters, 203, 254, 307, and 442 centimeters. Teams of students released the 70 helicopters in random order and measured 
the flight times in seconds. And the class used computer software to carry out a least squares regression analysis for this data. Here are a scatter plot, residual plot, and histogram of the residuals. Check whether the conditions are met for performing inference about the regression model. Um, all right. So L, linear. The scatter plot shows a clear linear form, right? There's not curvature. And the residual plot. Again, there's no curvature in that, so that's good. Linear check. Independent. This was a randomized experiment, so since they were released in random order and no helicopter was used twice, uh, we're going to consider them independent. So it's liner. That's L and I. N stands for normal. This is where we want to look at a histogram or a box plot of the residual. And again, they're usually going to give that to you. And you just have to say there's no strong skew or outliers. Equal standard deviations. Again, it's not becoming more spread out in the residual plot as we move from left to right. Roughly uniform. So equal standard deviation. We're going to say is satisfied and then random. This was a randomized experiment, so we're good. So remember the liner acronym. All right. So just a reminder in a sample regression line, A which is the y-intercept estimates alpha, the population y-intercepts, intercept. B, which is the slope, estimates beta, the population slope. This is the one we're actually going to be doing the most inference for. This is what I'm going to show you in your calculator that there are confidence intervals and tests for. And then S estimates sigma, which is standard deviation. All right, here we are going to skip over these slopes. And I'm going to skip this example. We're going to go to the next one. All right. T interval for a slope. When conditions are met, a C percent confidence interval for the unknown slope of the population or true regression line is your sample. Uh, slope plus or minus a t critical value. So this comes from a t distribution with n minus 2 degrees of freedom. That is important. Yes. Oh, yo. What's happening here? Weird. That's not on my iPad, but it is. Hold on. There. All right, sorry about that. So this is an important formula to write down. One thing that can happen is they can just give you computer output in which you would have to construct your own confidence interval, and I'll show you how you can do that. So it's a t-critical value with n minus 2 degrees of freedom, where c percent of the area is between negative and positive t. So we've seen computer output before and we've only needed parts of it. Now we can kind of talk about what all of it means. All right, everyone knows that cars and trucks lose value the more they are driven. Can we predict the price of a used Ford F-150 Super Crew 4x4 if we know how many miles it has on the odometer? So we have a random sample of 16 used Ford F-150 Super Crew 4x4s. And the number of miles driven were recorded for each of the trucks. Here are the data. I'm going to jump to here. So here is very commonly what they would do for you. You may be given the raw data, and then I'll show you how you can use your calculator. 
But equally likely is that they would just give you graphs like this um, and computer output. And what we want to do is construct and interpret a 90% confidence interval for the slope of the population regression line. All right. So let's real quick check our conditions. We're going to go down the liner. Acronym. Let's start with the easy one, random. Check. They stated it was a simple random sample. Let's go up to the top. Linear. The scatter plot looks roughly linear. No sign of a curvature in the residual plot. So we're good. Independent, this is your 10% condition. So we'll just state 10 times our population, which was what, or 10 times our sample. I'm going to say they're greater than 160 Ford F-150s. All right, the N is normal. This is where you want to look at the histogram of your residual plot, and there just needs to be no, no skew or outliers, which it does not look like they, there is, so check. And then the E is equal standard deviations. And that's, again, we want to look at the scatter plot and just make sure it doesn't look like the scatter gets amplified as we move from left to right. And here the scatter looks pretty uniform across the board. So we're good there. All right. So the first thing we want to do is look at the computer output and we want to construct uh, what would our regression equation be. So this is our sample regression equation going to be y hat equals and in this case in the context what are we predicting we're inputting what to predict what The sample data, but specifically in the context of this, we're trying to predict we're trying to predict price from miles driven. So our output should be price, right? So our y hat is price, and our input is miles driven. Yeah? Okay. And so we just want to keep that straight. Our miles driven is X and our output is price. So looking at this, you want to go to the coefficient column. And those are your coefficients. Um, your coefficient for miles driven, which is our X variable, is negative 0.16292. And then your constant, aka your Y intercept, is 38,257. So our equation then is y hat equals 38,257. Uh, and in this case, it will be minus, since it's negative, 0.16292x. So my interpretation, if there were zero miles driven, this would go away. Zero miles driven, it should cost me $38,257 to buy that Ford F-150, right? And then my interpretation of the slope, you can think about putting it over one, and slope is rise over run. So for every additional one mile I drive, the price is going to decrease by about 16 cents, right? 
So for every additional one mile I drive, the price would be decreasing by about 16 cents. Okay. And so here the idea is this is not necessarily the true population slope. I want to come up with a confidence interval for that slope. So I'm going to start with that. Negative 0.16292. And I'm going to add and subtract. A T critical value times the standard error of the slope. Now I specifically want a 90% confidence interval. So my T critical value, if we think about it in terms of this, we want a negative T critical value and a positive T critical value. We want to contain 90% of the data between those. All right, how many degrees of freedom do we have? Remember, in this case, it's n minus 2 degrees of freedom. So if we have a sample size of 16, how many degrees of freedom? So 14. All right, so we can use our calculator to find the correct T critical value. And we're going to use the inverse T function. And it's going to ask you for the area to the left of the T critical value. All right, so if we're trying to contain 90% in between these, how much area is to the left of one T critical value? 0.95. Great. So you're going to go to second distribution. You have that inverse T function, your fourth option. So I'm just going to do 0.95 and then we're going to tell it 14 degrees of freedom. There we go. We get 1.761. All right. So up here, we're going to go negative 1.6292 plus or minus 1.6292. 761, that's our T critical value based on a 90% confidence interval. And then we need to multiply that by the standard error of B. So the standard error of our slope, that's given in your computer output. And so here you can see in the column next to coefficient, that's your standard error coefficient. Which one is going to be the standard error of our slope, the top one or the bottom one? The bottom one. The top one is the constant, so that's the standard error of the y-intercept. The bottom one is miles driven, which is our slope variable, right? So our standard error is that 0 0.03096. All right, and then we just want to pop that in our calculator and get a left interval. Sorry, a left limit to our interval and a right limit. So we're going to get negative 1.6292. I'm going to do minus 1.761 times 0.0309. Six, enter. There's my lower limit. Negative. Oh, whoops, I'm sorry. That's wrong. It's not negative 1.6292. It's the decimal should be before the one. Delete. Insert. There we go. So negative. 0.2172. Little calculator trick. If you hit second and then enter, it just gives the last command. And then I can just change the minus to plus. Here's the upper limit negative 
108. Okay. So this is our answer. So we're 90% confident that the true slope of the population regression for price versus miles driven falls between negative 0.217 to negative 0.108. And so practically this just means you're losing anywhere from 21 cents for every mile you drive to 10 cents for every mile you drive in terms of value of the truck. All right, so that's how you hand calculate it. I want to remind you how to do this in your calculator. And by remind you, I mean show you the first time. But when I say remind, let's remind ourselves how to create a scatter plot and how to make a regression line over it. So take a minute. Let's put miles driven into list one and let's put price into list two. And then I'll walk you through how your calculator can actually construct that confidence interval for you. So once you've entered your data, hopefully you have something that looks like this. So I have the, the miles driven in list one. The price is in list two. I want to create a scatter plot out of that. I'm going to go up to y equals. I'm going to delete anything that's in there. And then I'm going to go into stat plot. Plot one, I'm going to turn on. Type, we want it to be a scatter plot. We want our X list to be list one, our Y list to be list two. Choose whichever mark you feel like is illustrative of your personality. I'm a square. And then uh, we'll do a zoom nine, zoom stat. There we go. So we see a clear negative correlation between uh, miles driven and price, right? As you increase the number of miles are driven, the price comes down. All right, we want to throw a regression line over that. So we did this way back in chapter three. Let's remind you how to do that. We want to go to stat. We're going to go to calc. And we want lin reg. It's the eighth option. There's actually two. There's Linreg AX plus B or Linreg A plus BX. They'll give you the same regression. It's just in the fourth one, A is your slope, B is your y-intercept. And in the eighth one, A is your y-intercept, B is your slope. And since the text we use does it in this way, let's just be consistent and use the eighth option. All right. I want my X list to be list one, my Y list to be list two, frequency list. We'll leave alone. And I want to store my regression equation in Y1. So there's a shortcut to Y1. If you have a newer operating system, you can do alpha trace. And that'll pull up your Y variables. And I can just enter Y1. If you don't have a newer one, you can also just do vars. You have to go to Y vars and then function and Y1's right there. And then I'll just put it in Y1 for us so that we can have it graph the regression line over our scatter plot. Boom, and you can see this is the exact same y-intercept and slope that we got with our regression output when we did the computer output, right? I mean, they rounded it, but that's the same as what we're getting here. All right, now if you go to y equals, you should see that regression equa equation in there. And now if you hit graph, it'll graph that over there for you. Here's a reminder, just because uh, Katie Brown was asking, what if I want to make a residual plot? Once you've done this regression equation, your calculator has already calculated all the residuals for you. The residual is just the difference between the line and the actual data value, right? So a residual is zero when the data value lies on your regression line. 
but you'll get a positive residual when the data value is above your regression line and a negative residual when your data value lies below it. And a residual plot is really just taking this and making your regression line the horizontal axis. But if you want to know how to quickly make a residual plot, if you go stat edit, and let's highlight list three, I can go list three, and then I can go into my list menu, which is second stat. And the last one, the seventh option is resid. And that's where your calculator stores your residuals. So boom, there's all the residuals now in list three. And so if I wanted to create a residual plot here, I'll turn this graph off real quick. I could now just do a scatter plot between list one and list three, and that would be my residual plot. There we go. And you can see this exactly matches the residual plot that they gave us down here. All right, so that's just a quick review crash course in what we did in chapter three. So let's go to the main menu, quit. And now let's tell it to give us a confidence interval for the slope. So we're gonna go to stat tests. And now we want a lin reg t interval. So this is your second to last option. Lin re linear regression t interval. Hit enter. All right, our X list is list one, our Y list is list two. Confidence level, we want 0.9. Now we'll just hit calculate. And there we go. Right, exact same confidence interval that we got when we calculated it from the computer output. Negative 0.217 to negative 0.108. So that's how you do it in your calculator. Questions about that? All right, let's move to our last thing. All right, so we can also do hypothesis tests. This is a funny example. Seems like this would be mm, unethical. But here it is. Infants who cry easily may be more easily stimulated than others. This may be a sign of higher IQ. Uh, child development researchers explored the relationship between the crying of infants four to 10 days old and their later IQ test scores. A snap of a rubber band on the sole of the foot caused the infants to cry. <laughs> the researchers recording the crying and measured its intensity by the number of peaks in the most active 20 seconds. They later measured the children's IQ at age three years using the Stanford Binet IQ test. This table contains data from a random sample of 38 infants. All right. Do these data provide uh, convincing evidence at the alpha equals 0 0.05 le level of a positive linear relationship between count of crying peaks and IQ in the population of infants? All right, so same conditions would apply. Liner has to be linear, 10% rule. Your residual plot has to have no skew or outliers. You don't want your residuals to get bigger as you move from left to right. And then it has to come from a random sample, which we're just going to assume all these conditions are met. And then we want to conduct a, a significance test at the 5% level to see if there is a positive linear relationship. All right, so what would our hypotheses be? What we're hypothesizing about is the slope specifically. So do you remember what we called the population slope?
Let me give you a hint. Y hat, this is the sample regression line. What's the slope? What if, if you guys passed algebra one, what's the slope of that? <laughs> B. All right, what's the population slope called? It's a Greek letter, remember, if it's for a population. Oh my God, you guys, you're not allowed to go to college. You're not going to get into any of frats or sororities. <laughs> Beta, there we go. So we're making hypotheses about beta. If there is no positive linear correlation, then beta, we're going to assume, is zero. Right? There's no slope. If there is a positive linear relationship, then there should be a positive slope. So beta should be greater than zero. And that's what we're looking for evidence of, right? Okay. Here's the good news. If you're given regression output, like computer output like this, they've already run the test for you. And your p-value is in this column labeled P. So what's the p-value for the slope? Which one of those? The top one or the bottom one? The bottom. The top one is the constant, so that's the y-intercept. The bottom one is your variable, aka your slope, right? So the p-value for us is 0 0.004. If we're comparing that at the 0.05 level, do we reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis? We reject the null hypothesis. So we would say, our p-value, oh, and I'm sorry, that's actually a p-value for a two-sided test. So the p-value that they give you by default is for the alternative hypothesis that beta is not equal to zero. If you have a one-sided test, which we do here, you just divide that by two. So we would reject regardless, but dividing that by two, of course, we still reject because 0.02 or 0 .000, 0 0.002 rather is still less than 0.05. And so we would say, there is convincing evidence of a positive linear relationship between the crying peaks and IQ score in the population of infants. That makes sense. That's why I was such a crybaby when I was young, because I'm extremely smart. Um, real quick, one more time, I want to show you how to do it in your calculator, and this will be the last thing we do. So let's enter cry count into list one and IQ into list two. My data matches the computer output that they gave us, then I entered the data correctly. If not, I probably miss something but I have 38 in both so that's good all right so here's what we want to do let's quit to the main menu second mode let's go back to stat tests and instead of a lin reg t interval now we're going to run a lin reg t test our x list is list one our y list is list two and then we just want to change our beta to be, in this case, greater than zero. That's our alternative hypothesis. And then we'll just tell it to calculate. Um, let's see. The p-value doesn't exactly match what they have but that may be because we have a more precise t critical value so let's see if the rest of it my sample regression line is 
It's slightly different from theirs. I think I messed up a data value. <laughs> Let's see. One? Is that right for that second piece of data? That can't be right. Uh, what, it should be 12? Yeah. Okay. That's what's screwing me up. All right, let's try again. Stat, tests, Linreg T test. Okay. Okay, now now my slope and y-intercept match what their computer output was, and our p-value is point. Uh, zero, 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 basically eight, nine, five, five. So yeah, we would reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative. So that's how you run it in your calculator. You just enter the data and then it's linreg t test and it'll spit out your p-value. And that is it folks. That, that's the, uh, AP statistic.